Oneros is an absolutely fantastic experience that falls on blind eyes. Its realistic yet mysterious approach to world building, the bright color palette, ways in which the story progresses, transitions throughout the journey, comedic moments, strategic methods regarding puzzles, and enjoyability from beginning to end, all of it together paints a journey of a man created by Coal Valley Games. This new endeavor for the creator's developmental journey was a way for the developer to branch out. After years of experience as a game developer, he always felt the need to make a story-driven game. So in 2018, he started production. After two years of hard work, on May 27th, 2020, Oneros was public for the world to see. Or not see with Barely any high quality reviews on Steam, currently 29, or in general, currently 2, it saddens oneself when one finds such an amazing experience that not many individuals get the chance to equally share the creative encounter. The simplistic answer as to why Oneros isn't more well known is either because of lack of simple marketing, which honestly doesn't make a lot of sense because this account has been tweeting for about 2 years, and all of these video clips that he's posted get hundreds of views. Like 800, almost a thousand, 4,000 right here, 8,000. So obviously he's getting this attention, but it's not really transferring over to Steam, which is really weird. Or because this game was created by Coal Valley Games, a one man studio that has no games to their name besides Oneros. Sure, the same person worked on mobile projects, several prototypes for different projects, and tributes, but Oneros is a different story because Oneros was a one-man band, whereas the other projects listed in his portfolio on his website were ones that aren't necessarily connected to the Coal Valley brand besides Oneros. Since Oneros is so invisible in the marketplace, I implore you to experience it on your own time rather than watch a dissection of it before you fully experience the beauty that is Oneros. Not just for spoiler's sake, mind you, but because I want to better support this developer due to the fact that this game deserves more attention, more good reviews, and more people to go on this journey. And the less you know about it, the better of a quest you'll have. Then you'll understand why I believe this game is a 10 out of 10. Once it's loaded, the intro opener is a folksy melody. It's honestly a vibe, and although normally I'm not one for folk music, the song really puts you in the mood. I literally did not want to start the game because that's how good the song was. Which makes sense because it's Hello, Peace of Mind by Bite the Buffalo, and is now added to my Spotify. Besides that, the only other noteworthy detail before the game starts is that there are five empty save slots. <laughs> You bro, apparently I can't count. Okay, cool. This is so that not only can you make a save for each chapter of the game, if that's what you want to do, but to give the other people the chance to experience this journey, not just you. Which, speaking of saving, you can save whenever you want, which is always very much appreciated. <laughs> Oneros is separated by chapters, opening with a first-person cinematic. The girlfriend calls Liam, telling him she's waiting outside in the car for him. Liam heads towards the door, or tries to, except the motion blur is very obvious when he first starts, so you just turn it off, making the game way better without motion blur. You go towards the door, but it's locked. With this fact in mind, Liam is now open to the idea of finding the key, which starts the soft tutorial with its floating words that are stapled to the wall and the door, and whenever you learn a new ability about your character in general, it will appear somewhere in the world that is very obvious. When searching the bathroom for the key, it only takes about 20 seconds for the first comedic moment to start. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. What kind of a sick mind would come up with this? This joke not only brings up the fact that the game has a funny charm to it, but that the voice acting is actually pretty good. Jason's not so bad once you get to know him. I just think he's not the same as he was when you were kids. Honestly, the first area is pretty crucial to the game, not only from a technical standpoint on how to actually play the game, but that it teaches you to search areas, get items, and then use said items to solve problems, which is the basics of all of the puzzles. Personally, I love to explore whenever I get the chance, and this game lets me do that without hand-holding me. But it's 
also a double-edged sword because the puzzles are mind-bending. Once you get out of the bathroom, you're in the theater, which leads you to the first puzzle. So using puzzle one as an example, I thought it had to do with the amount of posters, the arrangement of the posters, the arrows with the numbers, which direction the sequence of posters went. Nope. Instead, the numbers were just listed on the screens. Like, literally. And part of me died inside because I was overthinking so much where I was counting posters, going to the numbered rooms, checking all the bathrooms for something to help, looking for items. Nope. I just had to look at specific screens at the right time. Bruh. Now, before I even had a chance to solve the puzzle, I was too busy admiring, oh, I don't know, everything in the theater. The posters on the wall with the movie spoofs, the world building dedication, the aesthetic of everything. While I was soaking in the atmosphere, I was looking at the screens near the cash registers of the theater, and while admiring it, I accidentally knocked over all the pull <laughs> things. Which made oh me laugh. Gosh. Near that area, there's a photo booth that you can actually go in. And you know what's even better than that? You can knock over all of the tables and chairs and fire in your face and rub in some fun. Wait, you, you can't jump over the counter. Immersion broken. After destroying my mental sanity, as well as those tables, the second area is an intermediate dark void that isn't a parking lot. With the writing on the floor that things are not always as they seem, it reveals how self-aware the protagonist you're playing actually is. Yep, definitely going mad. Liam wakes up in his room and goes to the door. Again, it's locked. So now Liam has to scrounge around literally through his entire room to find the key. This is where your lessons in the first chapter will come in handy. When you pick something up and then drop it, instead of placing it back where it was, you literally just drop it. Which made me laugh because it caught me off guard. These items can be anything from a paper which has realistic moving physics, a block game mini puzzle, unique battle royale too, which made me laugh, and another meta moment, this time from You Skate Magazine. It used to be better. Nowadays it's filled with ads and sponsored content. I don't know why I still subscribe to them. Dang, Oneris really be calling out YouTubers nowadays. All of a sudden, Liam becomes lightheaded faints. Which was a little annoying because I still wanted to look around the room some more, but thankfully it was just for story progression sake. Liam wakes up in a memory chamber, a long blue and orange tinted hallway. This is where we first get to experience a memory firsthand. Come on, please, pretty please. I'm not gonna laugh or anything. Sarah, come on. I haven't played in years. I don't remember anything. Just a snippet, I'm sure you remember something. Only once, come on, please. Liam then continues to walk, only to be transported to a car that he's driving. And then back again. Eventually, Liam stumbles across a machine with missing gears. This means you'll have to find all the missing gears. I'm just glad the gears aren't too far away, otherwise it would be a little obnoxious. Once you go through the door, by making the machine work, you wake back up. Oh my god, that was so strange. You know, you could tell a lot from a person by what's in the room. So, in a sense, he was a skater boy. Just like Miami Street Skater, a game on Liam's computer. This laptop hosts a variety of entertainment opportunities. Unicorn's Revenge, a simple platform. Miami Street Skater, a skating game where you keep going into Stuff, a locked document that holds some secret celebratory info for Liam's girlfriend's birthday. Gallery, many photos that are mostly from the beloved Venice trip. And Donkey Talk, a DMing service that- Hey Sarah, great you're here. Uh, I'm not- I'm not Sarah. It was Jason, right? I- I, I don't know what Jason. He seems like a super cool guy. <laughs> I'm like, Liam. Whoa, 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 hold up! You can't just smack talk my boy Liam! Maybe you could bring him with you next time? I told you, Tracy. I don't know any Jason. Please? No. Sarah? You there? 
Oh. Oops, I uh, forgot I was in Sarah's account. <coughs> now, after you have a horrible conversation with Tracy, you attempt to cleanse your mind by looking around the room again. When doing so, Liam notices three interesting things. First is that along with unique Battle Royale too, wow, how original, there are other fake game cases with real commentary. The best game to just chill and cruise around town for no particular reason. Great game. I've heard a sequel's coming up soon. I don't really like it, but I gotta cheat, so I'm not complaining. Nah, I like the first and second one. Maybe a little bit of the third one, but now it's really getting out of hand. Second is that the game actually rewards you for exploring by providing hint candies around the room. And by hint candy, it's a tasty treat that gives you a hint when you eat it. Okay, I need to open the metal box too. I'm pretty sure someone's messing with me right now, so it's worth checking. If I remember correctly, the combination was the street number in Manarola. Last of all, you can stick stuff on the board, which helps you organize your clues. Kind of like, you know, those, uh, what's it called? Those, wow, I'm so stupid. Before you know it, you eventually faint again and appear back in the blue world. But this time, it's different. It's your bedroom with the big bed, and that's it. This leads Liam to another area, where he can now shift gravity, creating the scenario of a physics-based puzzle. Liam then wakes back up again, which will be the final time in this chapter. Since literally the entirety of chapter 2 solely takes place in this bedroom, Liam is there for a while, which means that it will take a long time to finish that area once and for good. This is why, when I first finished the chapter, I literally cheered so loud when I got the door unlocked. Which leads you to another blue memory chamber. Yeah, yeah I'm, at I'm at that birthday at party. party. Bro, oh, calm oh, down. Oh, I got the car, don't, don't worry. I'm, I'm telling, telling you, I'll, I'll, be, you. There. I'll be there. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. 11, 11 at the Willis gas station. Gas station. The white door transports you to a floating sky island, where the environmental tone is different than the other chapters. It's peaceful. It's beautiful. It's honestly- Hey, you! Stop talking to yourself! Oh. Uh, never mind. Your attention is now fixated on the talking bird, the comic relief of this island. You're not what? alone here! That bird just talked to me? Yeah! You, genius! I can hear you too, you know! This specific interaction made me die of laughter, and is why the bird is literally the best character in the game. Even though he's a bit weird. Who are you calling weird? Opening the door of the shed, since that's where Liam was initially heading, sends you back on a memory trip to the car. Alright, it's open now. There's this road again, but when was that? Which leads Liam to believe that in order to get his full memory back, he must fix the car on the island, and makes me thankful that the memory fragments are present throughout the chapters to slowly build the overall storyline. Since you found two checklists, one on the ground in front of the shed before opening it, letting you know the rough outline of what you need, if you so need a hint, and a checklist of car parts, Liam is ready to find everything he needs to fly away. Since Liam is still in the shed, he finds a radio, battery charger, a fuel maker, and a... <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the game just wrinkled me. <laughs> the game literally took my ambition to investigate every single spot of the game and <laughs> made me fall victim to it by way of Rick Astley. Oh, that's incredible. After turning the shed upside down, the other part of the island that is necessary to travel is the edge of it, where a rickety bridge connects two islands. I'm not kidding you, I thought for sure the shaky bridge would fall apart. It literally gives you anxiety with its shakiness, unsupportive presence, and unsettling sounds as you step onto it. Once you're done dying from an anxiety attack, the last few car parts are in the basement, so with your knowledge of watching 13 episodes of Sherlock, you unlock the door and creep down the stairs. Weed killer. Oh, it sounds like a good name for a police squad. <laughs> Man.
<laughs> this game's funny. Scrounging around the rest of the parts in the basement, Liam heads back to the shack where he stacks all that he's racked up, especially from the back. Since Liam is making a flying car, I could not help but get Vietnam flashbacks to Alcatraz, where you also have to escape an island, but instead of running for yourself, you're running from yourself. In order to do that, after basically assembling the car from Meet the Robinsons, you need to fuel it. It's not working. I said you need to fuel it. Maybe there's something missing. Fuel it! Ah, oh, crap. Something went wrong. How do you... make... the fuel? Compared to every other instance in the game, the fuel cooker was confusing to use, because not only do you have to time it right, but you have to make sure that you actually have all the ingredients, and the only way to know how is to use the hieroglyphics you were given. Deciphering said hieroglyphics leads you to finally input the fuel. Which, I don't know how eco-friendly the fuel is since it's made up of fermented substances and vodka, but since it's a dream, the environmentalists can't get mad at me. Since you're running off toxins, the flying leads to the car dream again. But this time, it's different. Hey, isn't that Sarah's car? Uh, impossible. She wouldn't drive that fast. <laughs> What's happening? No! To every beginning, there's an end. But is the end the beginning? You remember that this is the same theater from chapter one, except there's people. After all this time, these are the first people you actually see. Liam walks out and sees that there is the very same hallway. The exact same hallway. It's now bustling with what appears to be the life, except everyone is made up of polygons, as if the civilians from Super Hot are on their day off. These civilians are in two groups, the Ticketmasters and the moviegoers. Ticketmasters don't speak English. But the moviegoers speak in this weird text-to-speech accent. You were supposed to do it today. My turn was yesterday. Please, I'm leaving early today. Besides, it's not that bad, at least he's cute. The bathrooms are similar in and of itself, except for a few key elements. The reflections in the bathroom are fractured, which is suddenly ominous because you can't help but feel unsettled. All of the white in the bathroom is now black, opposite to how you start your journey, making it vastly contrast. Escaping the dark bathroom leads you to the commonplace of the theater, where it's as bustling as ever. Noticing the black contrast again, Liam realizes he can order food. But wait, he... he doesn't have any money. That's okay, Liam. We can go ask around for some. Excuse me, sir. Can I... Yellow snow lemonade? Dude, I don't even have enough money for popcorn, and that's like five bugs. <sighs> okay, fine. Here you go, dude. Wait, why did I even need to hold this spot? There's not even a line to begin with, and there's only one person in here. <sighs> At least there's a conveniently placed ID card. Once you figure out how to pull an identity theft gym, I mean nurse, another memory appears. A warning. Hey, Sarah, hey, Sarah. Look, look at these photos. these photos. What photos? What are you talking about? You followed Jason and took photos out of hiding? What's wrong with you? Liam, calm down. I'm sure you're exaggerating. If that's the case, maybe at least the police will believe me. Gee, Sarah, he just lost it completely. Let's stop him before he does something stupid. All of a sudden, the theater changes to a hospital. To your hospital. I'm so sorry. I I should have listened to you when you tried to warn me. It's been two months already. How long do we want to keep him here? What you're talking about, it's not over yet. You were supposed to do it today. My turn was yesterday. You're in a coma. And after this revelation, you feel as if you've been here before. Oh, farts. <laughs> the 
The term Oneros is a mythological Greek word for dreams that were personified. Since the game is titled such, we know that these dreams are personifications, and personifications are a personal nature or human characteristic to something non-human or the representation of an abstract quality in human form. With that in mind, Oneros contains dreams that are either personal to Liam and or contain a vague image of an individual person. Personal dreams that are obvious are chapters 1 and 2, where Liam's girlfriend calls him and where he wakes up in his room. These have occurred in Liam's life on a daily basis, hence why they are personal to him. He experiences these well enough to be the first thing he thought of in his dreams. As Liam slips deeper and deeper, it's present in chapters 3 and 4. We go from the personal nature of dreaming to the abstract form of dreaming. Initially, we only see this in between chapters, but as time goes on, that starts to infect the chapters, creating this abstract world in chapter 3 that Liam hasn't been to. That's why in chapter 4, we get a combination of personal and abstract, since Liam managed to escape the realm where it was all abstract, and is starting to gain footing on reality again. This hits Liam dead in the face once he learns that he was in a coma, which leads him right back to the loop where everything crazy started happening. If you see someone doing good in the world, support it. If a developer takes two years of his life to create a passion project, let him know that his time was valued for creating the project. If you appreciate what someone has done, say thank you. Oneros has a lot of threads, and it uses small chunks of story to weave an overarching story of chance, suspicion, justice, to tell the tale of how Liam gave his girlfriend's friend a chance, how Liam was suspicious about him by taking photos of him from a long distance, and how Liam tried to seek justice by taking the evidence to police, only to have him crashing in the process of seeking justice. This shows the part of people's lives that we barely get to see. We only know a glimpse of what they reveal. Another thread was the story he was creating by himself. Liam, on his own, made his own adventure, made his own acquaintance, figured out his own struggles, all while the world didn't make sense to him. Where the further he went down the rabbit hole, the more that his world became abstract. This shows the part of us as individuals that we get to see in its entirety, where we get to see every little speck of what we don't reveal. All in all, support people when you can. You may never know how complicated their life really is. They're trying to make it on their own, when what they truly need is reassurance that they are not alone.